First Corinthians chapter 13. In verse 13. Would you read for me? Are you there? First Corinthians chapter 13. In verse 13. I want you to read it out loud. One, two, go. Do it again. All right, now there are different languages. And I can hear some other reading it. Yeah, you're reading the Arabic Bible. That's cool. Praise the Lord. And now abide at what? Faith, hope, love. These three. And then it says, and the greatest of these is what? One more time. <laughs> now, I'm talking to you about these three. Faith, hope, love. These three. And I've taken some time to write down a few thoughts for you. Because um, I know sometimes getting accurate information... It's not very easy. A lot of times we get information from another person's head. You understand? But it's so important that we get accurate information from the Spirit of God. Anointed information that we can live by. You understand? And so I'm going to give you a few definitions that I've written down here that will help you a great deal. And... Uh, just a few thoughts that you can write down. I, I put this down just for you. So faith, hope, and love. We just read from the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13. It says, now abide at these three. He says, these three remain. That means when all else is gone, the three principles that will not die. He says there are three principles that we remain. Why? Because these three principles are the three creative principles of the human spirit. Write that down. It's so important. These are the three creative principles of the human spirit. They will not pass away. He says other gifts. The gifts of God, gift for healing, gift for prophecy, all of these other beautiful things will pass away. They'll come to an end. When our ministry in the earth is over, they will also be over. But these three will never be over. They'll always be there. But among the three, he says, the greatest is love. Animals don't have this. A dog may like you. A cat may like you. But it can't love you. Love is different. When I define love for you, you understand why it's different. It's different. These three principles are factors that help us understand the spirituality of human nature. They help us understand the yearnings of the human person. They help explain why we are the way we are. And why we do the things we do in the way we do them. When you get to understand faith, hope, and love, you'll understand yourself much better. And it will help you understand the things about God that you never knew. Praise the Lord. These three principles of faith, hope, and love can be applied 
or acted upon. Don't forget that. They can be applied or acted upon to produce positive or negative results. To produce creative or destructive results. Faith, hope, love. These are forces. And you can use them for what they were intended for. Or you can misuse them. They can produce extraordinary positive results and or produce extremely damaging results. They can bring out the best in anybody or bring out the worst in anybody. And like all laws and principles, they don't function on their own. They must be applied or acted upon. Remember that. Just because there's faith, there's hope, there's love, doesn't mean they're going to work on their own. They will not produce results on their own. They must be acted upon like all other laws or principles of life. And because of that, it makes it possible for anybody to make a choice of what you're going to do with them. What are you going to do with faith, hope, and love? Each one of us has faith, hope, and love. Each one of us. What are you going to do with yours? Now, I want us to put this in perspective, all right? What is faith? And what is hope? What is love? How can I use this? How can I put this into work, into effect in my life? Simple. That's why you're here tonight. Write this down. Faith is for now. Just right. Faith is for now. Hope is for the future. And love is for always. Let's do that again. You got it, right? You got it. Faith is for now. Hope is for the future. Love is for always and when you study what we just read in that first Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13 it says now about it faith hope love these three and it says the greatest of these is love if the greatest of these is love then we should begin from love we'll start by defining love what is love What is love? All right, write this down. It's important. Love is that enduring value of a person that gives you a sense of his or her importance to you. Brief, but powerful. Love is that endearing value of a person that gives you a sense of his or her importance to you. See why I told you to write it down? Because there's no dictionary that defines it that way. They can't know it. Because love, the Bible says, love is of God. God is love. And you can't know love until you know God. You see that? Okay, so what does this mean? What does this mean? 
Love means, therefore, on the basis of this definition, love means I am valuable to God. I am valuable to God. It means I'm somebody because I'm valuable to God. And it's an enduring value. Not a passive value. That means he values me. He wants me. I'm important to him. Praise God. If that is true, my life therefore must have a meaning. Write that down. Don't forget it. My life therefore must have a meaning. If it's true that I'm valuable to God, it must mean that my life has a meaning. It means I'm not here for nothing. Think about this. Think about this. You know, we talk about great men and women who have come to this world. Okay? But then, there are those mentioned by God. Okay? In the scriptures. Think about a man like David. David was a great man. The Bible says he was a great man. Did a lot of beautiful things. And God honored him. But what kind of a man was David? How did David think? What went through his mind? Why was David such a remarkable character to God? Why did God speak so well of David? How did he reason? What kind of a man was he? In the 23rd Psalm, you know Psalm 23, don't you? Okay. In the 23rd Psalm, reading from verse 1, David said, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. My goodness. I mean, you don't even have to go far before you realize what the man thought about God. And why his life had springs in his steps. Why was David such a success? Why was his life so victorious? He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He didn't say, my father is a rich man. He didn't say, uh, my family has some money, I think I'll do fine for a while. He didn't say, well, I come from a broken home. I don't know what's going to happen to me. He didn't say, well, uh, my family is broke. We don't have money. I don't know what my future is going to be like. David didn't think like that. He didn't think like that. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That means I will not lack anything. Do you know what it is to begin to think like that in your life? Do you know what it is to think like that? This is the way the man thought. Remember, he didn't think like this just because he had become a king. No, he was a shepherd boy. He was a shepherd boy. He knew what it was to be a shepherd. He took care of his father's sheep. And one time the Bible tells us, that a lion came out and took one of the kids. And David went after the lion. He was a young man. A teenager at the time. 17 years old. He went after the lion. And he said he caught the lion by his beard. And smote it. He killed the lion with his hands. And rescued the lamb from his mouth. Man, oh my. Another occasion. A bear came. And took one of the lambs. Again, David went after it. And with his hands, he killed the bear. So when David says, the Lord is my shepherd. You can understand why he lived such a fearless life. If he would go after a lion and kill it to rescue his lamb, 
if he would go after a bear and kill it to rescue his lamb, then he would think some great thoughts about God. He said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not want for protection. I shall not want. You know, David took out the sheep to pasture. And he could think like that. Think about God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Hallelujah. Yeah. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He makes me lie down in green pastures. That's the way David thought. I'm thinking about somebody here tonight. Maybe there's no one to take care of you. Maybe you are alone in your life. But can you think like David? Can you say the Lord is my shepherd? I shall not want. Can you think like David? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He take care of me. Hallelujah. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. That means he puts me in the midst of abundance. I'm surrounded with abundance. You see, David didn't only think like this. He said it. He said it. That's why we can read it. He said it. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Then he said, he leads me beside the still waters. He restored my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. Oh God. For his name's sake. Oh, glory to God. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah. For his name's sake. He said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. I fear no evil. You know, we're living in a day where there's so much fear. There's fear within and there's fear without. There's fear everywhere. People are no longer thinking safe as they used to. Kids don't play outside like they used to. Not many people stroll out like they used to. All the large open spaces you have for your houses have become an old story. Old fashioned. What happened? Life has changed. There's terror. But David said, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Oh, hallelujah. I fear no evil. Oh, I'm stared in my spirit. I'm stared in my spirit. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? He says, for thou art with me. Thou art with me. Say it with me. Thou art with me. <laughs> thy rod and thy staff. <laughs> they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Not in their absence, in the presence. In other words, you don't care about your enemies or adversaries. You don't care about them. A table is set before you right in their presence. That means they don't count. 
They're not a factor. You got enemies or adversaries? They're not a factor. They don't count. It doesn't matter that they're there. It doesn't matter that somebody doesn't like you. You know, even if he spoke to you, to your face, and he said, and he said to you, I don't like you. You say, that doesn't count. That doesn't count. I don't mean nothing. No, that doesn't count. He said, I don't like you. Forget it. That doesn't count. That don't mean nothing. Hallelujah. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Then he said, goodness. <laughs> goodness and mercy shall follow me. Not only on Sundays. Are you still there? Goodness and mercy shall follow me. All the days of my life. And I will dwell <laughs> in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. Can you see why that man was so great? Think about his mentality. The way he thought. Now, you ought to think that way. God gave us the record so that we can think the same way so we can think the same way you know the bible talks about a woman who had hemorrhage bleeding for for 12 years until nobody could take care of her anymore in the fifth chapter of saint mark's gospel from verse 25. You can read it down all the way to verse 34. The Bible tells us about this dear woman. She had been a wealthy woman. Until she got sick. And uh, she tried to get some doctors to help her. The Bible says she spent all her living. On doctors. Everything. Was wasted from paying them. And instead of getting better. She got worse. Do you know any case like that? Have you ever heard a story like that? Somebody got worse. The modern doctor is trying to fix the problem. The worse. He got until all the medical bills had become so high, he began to sell his property just to stay alive. This woman spent everything. Her condition was so bad. Bleeding all the time. Bleeding all the time. She was in this predicament, this embarrassing situation. And a desperate situation too. No one could help her. She got worse by the day. You see. Ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't matter what you're going through in your life. Amen. Amen. Trouble comes to people. Whether you're good people or bad people makes no difference. Trouble comes to everybody. It's what you do when trouble comes that matters.
Never think that your problem is too big. Never think your problem is insurmountable. Don't accept that your condition is incurable. Don't accept it. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. Remember, many years ago, they said malaria was incurable. Many years ago, they said tuberculosis was incurable. Now they tell us. You know it. <laughs> HIV AIDS is incurable. Now every time you hear incurable from anybody, you say that's the limit of your understanding. Why should anybody's life be dependent on the limitation of somebody's thinking? <laughs> Refuse to have your life limited by the limited understanding of somebody else. There's no sickness that's incurable. It's only incurable when someone hasn't thought about it. Anything that has a beginning has an end. Anything that can start can be stopped. Are you there? Think like this. Think like this. Oh, think like this. Did you know? Oh, come on here. See, there's so much that God has shown you. God has shown you so much. Why wouldn't you have faith? See, when I'm done seeding you with the seeds of God tonight, you can do anything. Hallelujah. Don't let anybody tell you something is impossible. No, come on. Think about it. Think about it. What is it? In human life. That's impossible. Maybe you're in a wheelchair right now. And they told you, you will never walk again. You will never walk again? Do you believe that? You know, somebody said one time, I don't mind preachers preaching what they preach, but I don't like them giving false hopes to people. I said, ain't that... Think about that. That's a stupid remark. False hope? What is false hope? False hope is hope on falsehood. Yeah. The only false hope there is, is hope that is based on falsehood. You must know that my message is false before you can say, I am giving false hope. You must know that the message is false. You cannot assume. You must prove that it is false. Otherwise, you are arrogating to yourself more wisdom than everybody else because you think we are too stupid not to know that Jesus is for us. Isn't that crazy? What do you think? Isn't that crazy? 
maybe I should mention something here. You got to take this seriously. Take this seriously. You know, when Jesus was born, um, he was taken to the temple according to the custom of the day to be dedicated at the temple. And uh, when they got there, an old man, Simeon, prophesied about him. And an old woman, Anna, prophesied about him. And as this Simeon prophesied, he said something about the mother. And then he made an expression that I want to bring to your mind about Jesus. He said that the thoughts of many hearts might be revealed. Now, here's what I want to say about it. There are certain things about Jesus that when they happen, There'll be reactions that the thoughts of many hearts might be revealed. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Anyway, don't believe in poverty. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Because <laughs> you see, when you're poor, they marginalize you. And you don't have a voice. And then you take anything. And then you have to plead all the time. See. Refuse to be broke. Okay. Yeah. And in God's word. Will help you. Direct you. Position you. So that you will go. In the course that God has planned for you. And in God's direction for your life, there's no poverty. Poverty is not from God. No. Believe me. If God loves you, why would he want you poor? He's not poor. Why would he want you poor? If you're poor, you can't help someone else. So God doesn't want you poor. He wants you to have more than enough so that you can help other people. Otherwise, how can you express the love of God in your life? How can you help others when you have nothing? Think about that. See, if you think that God wants you poor, you always be poor. And poverty is a description of inability. It's got nothing to do with what you have or what you don't have. It begins with your mind. So refuse to be poor. Amen. And you say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. <laughs> Hallelujah. I was telling you about this woman that was sick with hemorrhage for 12 long years. You remember her? Okay. And this woman had no one to help her. She had become broke from paying the doctors, like I said. And so she got to this terrible situation. And the Bible says when she heard of Jesus. I like that. When she heard of Jesus, she said to herself, if I may touch but the hem of his garment, I shall be whole. Now, this is remarkable. 
When she heard of Jesus, she was already in a hopeless situation. But when the news came about Jesus, she heard of Jesus. Hope came to her. Hope came to her. There's someone here today. Hope came to you when you heard that we were coming for this meeting. Hope came to you. Hope came to you. You've been waiting for this meeting. Hope came to you. And you're thinking, tonight I'm going to be healed. That's great. You know, there's a little boy who was brought to one of our meetings. And uh, the doctor said he'll never be able to walk. He couldn't walk. But he had watched a TV program. And he said to his mother, can you take me to Pastor Chris? The mother said, oh, that's a long distance. Oh, he said, but I'm going to be healed. He said, if you take me to Pastor Chris and he prays for me, I'm going to be healed. Now listen to the faith of this little boy. He said, if you take me to Pastor Chris, he'll pray for me and I'm going to be healed. So the mother said, you believe that? He said, of course. Mommy said, okay. We'll go to Pastor Chris then. So they came for the program. And sure enough, sitting inside, listening, the little boy was all ears, waiting for his moment. <laughs> Praise God. Just waiting for his moment. And then the time of prayer came. And I said, put your hand where you need a miracle. And he and his mother put their hands on his limbs and the boy was ready he was waiting soon as the prayer was said he said I'm healed he got up now when they brought him to the front and I saw the boy they said he, he had never walked and I said to him did you know you would be healed tonight he said yes he said I, I knew I would be healed I said, how did you know? He said, I knew. How did you know? He said, I just knew. Then the mother told a story. How the little boy said, take me to Pastor Chris and I will be here. And that was it. Listen, hope came to him. He knew he would never walk again. He had been told. He had prepared his life. He's going to be a lame man when he grows up. He'll never walk. He's been told. But then he watches this program and sees this others getting healed. And then hope comes. And he says, Mom, take me to Pastor Chris. Let's go there. He'll pray for me and I'll be healed. Praise God. See, the beautiful thing there is... He knew I was going to talk to somebody. His name is Jesus. Amen. That's why he said he'll pray. He'll pray for me. When we pray, we talk to God. We talk to Jesus. Because he's real. Tonight, it doesn't matter what your case is. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you can trust, now look at that woman, hope came to her. Hope came to her. When she heard of Jesus, she thought, oh, that means I'm not out yet. That means something can still happen. That means I can still be here. Then she said, if I may just touch his garment, I shall be healed. A dear lady came to the healing school. And uh, when she got there, she was in a wheelchair. She had been sick a long time. 
And now her limbs couldn't carry her anymore. So she couldn't walk. And while she was in that wheelchair, she was told, sorry, you can't get in because the place is full and uh, you just can't come in now. Then she said, okay, can I stay outside here? I just want to wait here so that when Pastor Chris passes by, I can see him when he passes by. Someone said, what's that to you? She said, well, if I can just see him, I'll be here. Now, this is remarkable. Now, there's something I want you to see here. It's about faith and hope. It's not about Pastor Chris. It's about faith and hope. You'll understand it in a moment. And so, the dear lady was in her wheelchair waiting for her moment. And pretty soon, the team came walking by with Pastor Chris among them. They're coming in. And the power of God comes on her in her wheelchair. She screams, her body trembling, falls out of the wheelchair, and she's instantly healed. How can you explain it? Let's go back to this woman who was hemorrhaging, who was bleeding for 12 long years. She says, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be healed. So she went out to look for Jesus. She heard he was coming to town. And there was Jesus with the crowd. And she was in a condition. She couldn't come out boldly. And just thinking, all I have to do is sneak in and try to touch his clothes. And then I can sneak out and just take my healing. So she went through the press and finally got close enough, stretched out her hand and touched the master's garment. And when she did, she felt in her body that she was healed and was sneaking away. And Jesus, oh, I love Jesus, you know. He spoke out loud and said, who touched me? And the disciples said, Master, I mean, the crowd throng at thee. In other words, everybody's touching you. How can you say, who touched me? Jesus said, somebody touched me. Meanwhile, the woman's trying to run away. The Bible says she was afraid. So she's trying to run away. And Jesus raises his voice louder. Somebody touched me. Who did? Then the Bible says, when the woman found out she couldn't hide, she turned back, trembling, and fell down before Jesus and told him all the truth. Oh boy. You see, it's a story of faith. Because the woman said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be healed. And then she went. She did it. And when she touched, she didn't need anybody to say, it's happened. No. She accepted it. She endorsed it. She received it. Turned around and was going here. But the master thought, no, it's not over yet. Faith must be completed. And did something more for that woman. By making her tell it. That's what Jesus did for her. See, it was a story of hope. Because she had become desperate. There was no way out. She had given up. Until she heard of the master. Healing people. Hope came to her. Maybe you too can be healed. Maybe it's not over for you yet. Hope came. I don't know if you're seeing that ray of light. Can you see hope coming to you in a situation where you need a change? Can you see hope coming to you? Can you see that your situation can be changed? Can you see there's a possibility? A young woman came to tell us her story. 
She was watching on television. And uh, she saw people getting healed on our program. And she said to herself, this cannot be real. This cannot be real. But since she said she was bored, she thought, okay, let me just keep watching. So she kept on watching. And finally, it got to the moment when I began to pray on TV. And I said, there's a young woman watching me. Who's sick? With HIV. You're not going to die. Hallelujah. You can receive your healing now. Now I was saying this on television. And she thought, dear God, does he know I'm watching him? <laughs> and she said she had thought she might just take her life instead of waiting to die. And I said, you can be healed now. And then I spoke the word. She found herself. She said she found herself believing. She believed. This could be her. She believed. And guess what? In the next few days. She found she got stronger and stronger. She found the symptoms in her body were leaving her. She thought, is this for real? And that man said, I was healed on television and I'm here. She said, is that possible? She thought, maybe I'll wait a few more days. She waited a few more days. She got stronger. Finally, she said, I've got to go to the, to the lab and get tested. She got there and tested HIV negative. She said, is this possible? I'm going for another test. She went for another test, negative. Then she said, I think I should take one more test. Maybe something's gone wrong. I'll wait a little while until I, I can really know this is right or wrong. She waited a while. And then went for another test. Negative. Then she came and told a story. And she's still negative. Hallelujah. <laughs> Why do these miracles happen? Because of what Jesus said to that woman. When he said, who touched me? And the woman came and fell down before Jesus and told him all the truth. She told him how she thought about it and came and did what she did, touching him and getting healed, then Jesus made the remarkable statement. He said, Woman, thy faith hath made thee whole. In other words, your faith has healed you. And wonderful, Jesus didn't say, my faith healed you. Jesus didn't say, my power did it. Why? Because his power was there. But the power will not work until somebody acts upon it. Until somebody activates it. The power of God is here tonight. But it cannot do anything for anybody until you act upon it. Can you see it? You've got to act upon it. The law of gravity is working here right now. But if you don't do something, you will not see the law of gravity in effect. You want to know if that law of gravity is working right now? If you've got a pen or a Bible or a bag, anything you got, raise it. Anybody got anything around you? Raise it. Hold it up. Hold it up. Can you hold it up? Hold it up. Okay, let it go. Release it. What happened? That's the law of gravity. You see that? But all the time, it was on your lap or on the floor. 
nothing was obvious. But the law was there. Nothing was obvious to you. Because nothing was happening. But the law was working. That's why it stayed where you kept it. Same thing with spiritual law. Healing is present here now. Mm. Can I show you something? St. John's Gospel. Turn to St. John's Gospel. Chapter 1. Let's begin reading from verse 6. 1, 2, go. Are you sure you saw it? That's a very strong statement. I want you to read it one more time. How many of you saw it? Raise your hand. Okay. Now, this is very important. If there's anybody here who wants to get healed tonight from anything, don't miss me here now. Listen very closely now. Very closely now. We're going to read that verse again. And if you, if you didn't get it before, you've got to get it now. Let's read it again. One to go. Thank you. Isn't this wonderful? The Bible says... There was a man. He didn't say there was an angel. He says, there was a man sent from God. Whose name was John. So, God sent a man. Now, we know that God sent Moses. We read about it. And the people in John's day knew about Moses. That God sent Moses many, many years prior to that time. Now, the Bible tells us, about John and says there was a man saint from God whose name was John John was given a definite message to take to his generation this is so important and when John came he said to them God sent me to you In St. Luke's Gospel, when you read from chapter 4, the Bible tells us how that Jesus also said to the people, The Lord has sent me to you. Amen. Jesus said it. Jesus was sent from God. He had to tell them. And when they believed that God sent him, his blessings upon them produced results. Listen, God sent me to you. And you know, this is so important. This is so important. God sent me to you. The things you're seeing are not done by the hands of man. They're not ordinary. God sent me to you. To bring you faith, hope, 
and love. You know, I defined love for you a moment ago. Let me give you that of hope. All right? Are you ready? Yes. Now, now, now. Moments into your miracle. You ready? Write down this. What is hope? Hope is the positive expectation of a desired end. Simple. It is the positive expectation of a desired end. Hope is a virtue. And I hope you wrote those things I told you. That there's no such thing as false hope. All right? The only false hope there is, is hope that is based on falsehood. All right? Hope gives you strength. Hope gives you a future. Hope gives you a purpose. You know, when you have hope, hope is for the future. You look forward to tomorrow. You look forward to something that can happen. The expectation of a desired end. Hope gives you a future. You say, I'm going to make it. I'm going to have it. It's going to change. I tell young people everywhere, don't give up. Don't give up. There's hope for you. There's hope for you. You know, Jesus brings you extraordinary hope. Cheer up, friends. There's hope for you. Hallelujah. You see, when you stir up your hope, polish it, nurse it, Protect your hope. If you will keep your hope alive, it cannot be denied. That woman's story I just told you is a story of hope. But then, the miracle happened. Hallelujah. Faith. I told you these three are necessary. Love is for always. Hope is for the future. Before you came here, you had hope. You had hope that if you will come for this meeting, there will be a change in your life. You know, when we were advertising this meeting, I told you, I told you that the most important thing of it all would be that your life will never be the same again. You know, when I share the word of God with you, I don't just share words. I impart something into you. That's why, you know, inside you right now, you feel like you're being stared. You're being stared. You're being stared within you. Yes. Christ gives you hope. Anything is possible. Christ gives you hope. His message brings you hope. That's what this hope. You can see yourself standing strong. You can see yourself being able to see again. You can see yourself being able to walk again. You can see yourself getting strong again. Something is happening inside you. Hope is coming to you now.
Can you imagine the greatness in your spirit? God is not through with you yet. Hope is bringing you strength right now. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. How many people you're going to be able to help when we finish from here? You will be a helper. You'll be a lifter. I said, these are great virtues. Faith, hope, love. What are you going to do with your faith? What are you going to do with your hope? Are you going to change your words? What are you going to do? Anything is possible. You can be a great medical doctor. You can be a great professor. You can be a great politician. You can be a great lawyer. Think about it. What are you going to do? You can be a great businessman. A businesswoman. Hope is coming to you. God is bringing you pictures. Look at this. Look at this great stadium. Isn't this beautiful? This was in the mind. Somebody conceptualized this beautiful calabash and thought about it and all that was necessary was to put enough money into it and get enough workers down here and get it built it was in someone's mind but look now let me tell you something this is not all there can be. Can you believe? You are moving into a future that's greater than what you are seeing now. Think like this. If you've got courage, show it in designing a new future for the whole world. You know, I think globally. And I began to think globally when I was 15 years old. I began to think about the whole world. And that's what I, that's what I extend to you. Don't just think about your surroundings. The world needs you. Are you hearing me? Young man, clean up yourself. Say there's something in me. The world needs me. Young woman, clean up yourself. The world needs you. Don't think of yourself like you're down and out. Don't think of yourself and say, well, I'll never be anything. I'll never amount to anything. No, if you would never amount to anything, you wouldn't be hearing me tonight. These, these are not words for non-entities. These are not words for those who are defeated in life. These are words for kings and princes. What I share with you tonight is for great men and women. And the reason you're hearing this tonight is because there's greatness inside you and God sent me to you to stay up that greatness in you. Hallelujah. No, look at this. This is a great stadium that was built primarily so that you could have the World Cup and then have something beautiful. But look what I did. I said, we're going to use it for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And we're here. 
years ago, when I was a student in the school, as I preached from school to school, I told them, I said, listen, the great stadia all around the world, you think they were built for football and other games? I said, no, God's too big for that. I said, the great stadia of the world were built for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then I went proving it. And I've been at it. Hallelujah. And you know something? They can't keep us out. Come on. No way. And that's why, you know, I told you, don't be poor. Be rich. To be rich is very simple. Let God's word guide your mind and make you innovative and give you thoughts and ideas to help other people get better. Success in life is helping other people fulfill their dreams. And in that way, your dreams are fulfilled. As you help other people become better, you become better. So success is two ways. The more you help other people become successful, the more successful you become. Can you understand that? Simple. So think through your life. Think through your business. Think through everything about you. You want to be more successful? Help someone else become more successful. Think about what others need and help them get it. And while you're helping others have their dreams come true, your dreams will come true. That's what it's all about. The greater you make other people, the greater you become.